All right, That's welcome to Dive Into World Building, and this is the Hangout topic that we couldn't seem to get to happen for weeks, because every time we tried it, things would go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, humor and pranks. <laughs> there seemed to be something very oddly appropriate about the fact that we just couldn't seem to get to this topic. Um, but I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad we're doing it. So um, welcome, everybody. You guys are so wonderful to keep coming back. Um, so let's see. Well, this was supposed to, to give you an indication of how long we've been trying to have this hang out. I think we were supposed to have it on April 1st. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was um, the original plan, I believe. So April 1st is sort of a special thing. Um, a holiday dedicated to pranks and other kinds of mischief. But it's not the only time of the year when mischief can happen. Um, so, yeah, so what do you guys... Are there other times of the year when mischief is expected? Halloween, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Halloween is another mischief time of year. <laughs> That's usually kind of meaner, I think. Yeah, well, mischief night, it's... Yeah, childish and mean and sometimes destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, though, though I have to say dressing up in costume is like one of my favorite things. So. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I've yeah. Better skip the trick and go for the treat and all's well. <laughs> um, I never did pranking. I just like. Halloween. <laughs> Candy. No, yeah. I, I know the French celebrate April 1st as a f sort of a fool's day. Hmm. What um, what goes on in Britain, uh, Brian? Well, given that we invented April Fool's Day, sort of, um, yeah, it used to be a tradition for um, people would, would come up with some pretty elaborate stories and japes and um, it used to be for, for some time a tradition with both television and the newspapers um, which would in some cases go to fantastically elaborate lengths. You can't do it now because you, there's so many satire sites that on any given day you know yeah. I see probably as many complete lies uh, coming through my Facebook feed as I do actual true news stories. But in those days, it was reserved for one special day that you could get away with doing this. Uh, the yeah. two most famous that I can think of is um, one was the BBC back in, I think it was the early 60s, um, did a, a very detailed story about the problems with the Italian spaghetti harvest. <laughs> there, was, there was a problem with the spaghetti trees and they were diseased and they weren't going to get a good spaghetti harvest and there was going to be a pasta shortage and so on and so on. And they had pictures of people wandering around collecting spaghetti off the trees and everything. I mean, they went to great lengths to do this. Um, the other one, which was much more recent, back in merely the, the mid-1980s, I think, or early to mid-1980s, was a fantastic Guardian one um, on the, the um, totally fictitious country of San Serif. Um, which was absolutely <laughs> shock full of magnificent typographical puns and jokes. Um, you should really look this up and see if there is there all the the original articles and pieces and pictures and maps and everything. It is. It was just magnificent. They must have spent weeks putting this together. It was superb. Really, really superb. Um, so yeah, we used to to have a, a, quite a tradition of doing these sorts of things. The BBC would always have some news story or whatever that was um, complete fake, and you know they they do just the kind of work that all the satire news sites do now. That that thing of trying to make it plausible enough, trying mm -hmm. to make it so that you think well it might be true, um, you know, so that they would kind of suck you, and then you go like oh wait a minute, what's the date? What's the date? Damn it! Um, <laughs> yeah. That, let me see if I can find any other particular example. That's... Let me let me see if I can find that San Serif thing anyway. San Serif Guardian April Fools. Yeah, the Guardian's most successful April Fools joke, San Serif. It's got a Wikipedia entry. <laughs> 
Salsa Reef is a fictional island nation created for April's Fool's Day in 1977, so earlier than I thought, oh. by Britain's Guardian newspaper. It was featured in a seven-page hoax supplement published in the style of contemporary reviews of foreign countries commemorating the 10th anniversary of the island's independence, complete with themed advertisements from major companies and everything. Oh. Um, Wow. Provide an elaborate description of the nation as a tourist destination and developing economy, but the place names and characters were all puns, all plays on words relating to printing, net font names, etc. It That's was just. Awesome. Was, was it yeah. the capital Helvetica? Um, <laughs> let's see if I can find out all the. <laughs> they used a semicolon shaped map. There was two <laughs> islands. One was one was round and one was a little curved <laughs> corner beneath it. Uh, so yeah, they had all sorts of stuff, and of course, um, the world being what it is, a large body of secondary work about San Serif has been written since 1977. <laughs> there is a Friends of San Serif Club. <laughs> oh my. So yes, it's um, it's very very cool. So well, that's, that's the kind of thing fun. we do. Yeah. <laughs> now what yeah. have you guys got? <laughs> Well, um, I don't know. I mean, online? there's a there's a tendency, I think, currently, in, at least currently in the U.S., for things to be really, really mean. Um, not not brilliant, like sans serif, where it's not really doing anyone any harm, you know. Um, but I think I think there is a potential dark side to all kinds of humor, um, and particularly pranks. You have to. Yeah, yeah, anyway, we can go into that later. Um, I know that I was told that in France they um, make little paper fish and um, try to stick them to your back <laughs> without you noticing. So you know, when you pat somebody on the on the back. But anyway, right? Yeah, so you end up with a fish on your back. But it's it's you know it's pretty harmless. Better than saying, um, better than say, you know, pinching people <laughs> or, yeah. or that sort of thing, or dumping water on them, and, you know. Why just you know, kick me well, instead of fish? Well, first, my daughter received a a collection of of prank items as a party favor, and I'm sure that this was in, in anticipation of of um, you know April Fool's Day. And one of them was a whoopee cushion. Uh, and one of them was this little thing that looked like it. You know, it was like sort of a styrofoam, uh, not styrofoam, foam ice cream cone. And, oh, yeah. you know, you want some ice cream, and then you press a little button on it, and then the foam part would launch off, but it was on a string. So, if, you know, if you had it close enough to your face, you would get pegged in the face with a foam uh, ice cream ball. We. <laughs> yeah. We had a we had a bottle of ketchup that was like that. It was just red. You'd squeeze it, and red string would just like squirt out. Yeah. 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 I love stuff like that. <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's this there's this with something like that. There's a sort of this dismay, right? But then you have the sort of well, no harm done kind of step to the whole thing. Um, anyway, no, it's just very interesting. I I'd like um, I have thoughts on humor, strangely enough. Um, tell us, tell us. Okay, so like my question is 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 humor universal and is it possible to be like a functioning sentient being without humor? Like, can you have a culture or a species in which humor simply does not exist and they do not understand it? And I remember watching something that seemed to argue that it was not possible, that humor is this essential thing psychologically and emotionally and yeah I, I'd say that's probably true though 
the way that it manifests itself, I think, is, you know, varies extremely widely. And, and yeah, it's definitely culturally uh, influenced in lots and lots of ways. So what's the purpose of humor? Hmm. I think it's play. I mean, I think it's a form of play. And Which brings up the question, what's the purpose of play? I know, I know. It's like usually, like, for a lot of animal species, only the, the babies play. And you cease, sort of. I mean, not, not entirely, but it, it ratchets way down. Mm -hmm. And as the animal grows to adulthood. Um, so are you so saying that, that it's been shown that only babies play, like parents well, not, don't play not, with their babies kind of thing, or...? No, not, not like, not only, but it's like the, if you watch like, 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 um, like lion cubs or something, they're all over the place rolling around, and the adults are like sitting there tolerating it, you right. know. Well, but they're not necessarily, well. but they're just sitting there. Um, but um, but I think I mean things do play later, but but it, it like it goes down as like the adult responsibilities and things. It's sort of like almost also like some animals are smart enough. Like crocodiles don't play, snakes don't play. Um, you know, I shrimp. I don't. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, there, there are just things. Cockroaches don't play. There are things that are just. Have you, maybe you have never, never watched a game of shrimp baseball. I cannot believe you've never watched a game of shrimp baseball. <laughs> so, so, like, the point is, is that there's almost like this correlation between things that are intelligent enough to play, and things that aren't intelligent to play, enough to play, and especially to play as adults. Like crows and ravens and stuff play in the snow for fun. Oh, birds totally. But, but this idea of something just doing something for fun, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. It's like there's not leisure time. You're sleeping, you're hunting, you're eating, you have to survive, and then once in a while, ooh, there's water, I'm going to go roll around in a pool. Um. Well, I think, um... Yeah, I it's think that, uh, yeah, longevity, intelligence. I think um, it's emotional too. Yeah. If you don't have like, it, uh, there's okay. So so, definitely we have a link between humor and emotion. Um, and I think play is definitely a learning, a learning thing. I mean. How are you going to learn to fight if you're a predator, as Brian is remarking in the chat bar? How are you going to learn to fight and do all the maneuvers and stuff um, unless you play it first mm -hmm. as sort of a practice, right? Yep. And I think, and I think that there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of play is about learning and testing and and leaving room open for failure to <laughs> failure to. Yeah. In a context when it is not life or death, mm -hmm. right? Because right. Does every play kind of practice, humor. Or anything was life or death, we we wouldn't last long. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, but but does that equal humor? Um. Well, okay. So here's a thought. Um. Here's a thought. Um. Some kinds of play, well, so I think one of the things that I've remarked about humor in the past is that humor is very often on the edge. And what I mean by that is it is usually playing on the edge of social rules of some variety. Um, playing on the edge of what is socially acceptable to talk about, for example. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's... Um, um, that, that's been the case for a long time. So you have, for example, the fools 
in the Shakespearean plays who have a very important role. Um, they are they are deliberately being goofy, and that allows them to talk about things that other people can't talk about because because they're sort of protected by the fact that they're only kidding, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, and I mean that whole thing with being protected by the fact that you can say, "Oh, I was just kidding." <laughs> Uh, it happens in a lot more contexts than just humoral, humorous uh, contexts, but um, yeah. So you've got so you've got fools and jesters. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it must have something to do with mental health too, and reducing tension. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I think it also has to do with honing our social skills too. Because it it hones our ability like certain types of wordplay, right, will hone our ability to talk about certain types of topics. And in a way it's a form of playing around with how to talk <coughs> about topics. Right? Um mm -hmm. how to explore uncomfortable things. Sometimes I think it might be a, a way to avoid talking about uncomfortable things. Yeah, that too. It can be that. But if you if you get the um, the mental health thing, it's you know you're in a stressful situation, you're in danger or things bad things are happening, and you just need to take a break from that. Right. So you know, you, you tell jokes or. You make something light about it. Um, Probably good for your health. Yeah. In a literal sense. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I mean, they say laughter is good for you, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, taking a step back from one's stress and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, some of the funniest people... There's this thing uh, that we were talking about, and I've seen it pop up a lot of times, where people who are in a lot of pain or who are suffering a lot can be the, the people who are the funniest. And in some, yeah. in some cases, it's how they protect themselves or distract themselves. But there's, there are... Um, restrictions on who's allowed to joke about a particular situation. Yep. I mean, the person who's in ill health can tell all the jokes that they want, and they they might make other people uncomfortable. Right. But, you know, the people you know, the people furthest away from the people you know the person at the center, the person who's in ill health, uh -huh. are the ones who might be most offended or most uncomfortable. But those are the people also. Less, but have uh, less. Uh, they don't have the permission to make those jokes. It's less mm -hmm. appropriate for them, and, and right. Less and I, think, uh, I think that's actually jokes. really important. <laughs> um, there's. It reminds me of that diagram that was going around about how to talk to people. Uh, who are part of a tense situation. Um, I think the example was, you know, if somebody has cancer. And this is actually, I think, relevant. Um, where if you're at the, at the center, in the middle of the situation, like if you're the sick person, you're able to dump your tension outwards onto people anytime you want to, right? But then the people who are one layer out from you, say, you know, your spouse or your sibling or whoever it is is in the next layer, is not going to dump on you because you're the sick one, right? And they're going to have to dump outwards right, by another layer. And any time that the, that the dumping sort of happens inwards, then it's inappropriate. Um, 
because whatever this stressful situation is, it's affecting the people inside more than it's affecting the people outside. Right? Right. And I do think that this actually applies to humor. Um, in, it, it's that whole issue of whether jokes punch up or punch down. Because in a lot of cases, a joke is articulating with a very difficult situation. Um, and if you're coming out at the end of the joke having dumped on the person who is most affected by the tension and pain and whatever this happens to be, um, then that's really not very okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's what they call a punching down kind of joke. Um, the more power you have in the situation, the, le the less you are suffering from a particular situation that's being joked about. Um, the more you should be the butt of the joke and not, um, and not the source of the joke. I, suppose. I don't know if that makes sense. I think that makes sense. It does. Yeah. <laughs> well, the finest tradition of punching up in terms of humor is the the legendary court jesters, I would think, which somebody mentioned in the sidebar already. Um, mm -hmm. You know, basically people who were, whose su supposed job was to mock the rich and powerful, um, including yeah. their own lord and master. It didn't always work out. James II had his uh, court jester banished because, yeah, he was offending too many people. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it doesn't always work. Yeah, and then you have things like the comedy roasts where it's like they're honoring a comedian by getting a whole bunch of other comedians doing sort of mean-spirited jokes about that comedian. Yeah. And that's a big honor. And, like, you know, in, in that community... It's for anybody now, though. Yeah. It's like a Justin Timberlake roast or something on Comedy Central. Like so, they just do anybody now. It doesn't even matter. It's not even a thing. <laughs> I I prefer the days when or you know you had pig roasts and you just ate them afterwards. I don't think that works with Justin Timberlake. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there we go with the humor. <laughs> um, I, th I think if I'm if I'm mocking. But Justin Timberlake, I think that counts as punching up. I think that's uh, yeah. I think I'm okay to get away with. Uh, none of us have his money. <laughs> <laughs> or power or influence or whatever. Well, there's, that's an interesting thing, though, because you talk about um, hierarchy of things like capital and uh -huh. in terms of what's allowable humor, what's not. Right. Uh, systems of privilege in the humor. Yep. Mm. Yes. Would be the short Absolutely. Hand. There are things that you know are taboo in humor. Things that are de rigueur in humor. Things that you do and do not do. Um, well, I mean, that depends on the. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, absolutely. There, there are all kinds of rules, and I think that if you were actually to engage a comedian in talking about this topic, um, you would discover that there's a lot of culture and tradition and all kinds of stuff surrounding the way that humor um, for public consumption is produced. Uh, that kind of thing. But, um, but unfortunately I'm not in that world and so <laughs> I don't really know what, uh, what a comedian would say about it other than what I've read you know in, in articles about uh, uh, comedians plagiarizing each other's jokes and this very strong sense of, you know, um, you can't you can't take an idea that somebody else has got in their arsenal and without giving them credit. And then there's sort of this complicated um, additional layer of uh, structure added when you start being paid for being funny. As soon as you start paid for being paid for anything, then you've got to look at what the situation is, who is paying, and how do you make sure that they keep paying you. So, yeah, you don't want to offend the people who are paying you, which yeah. is in ironic contrast with, in fact, as I say, going back to the court jesters, because they were mocking, in, in some cases, the very people who were paying them. But they would yeah. obviously you know, be trying to walk a fine line 
by you know amusing their lord and master in you know by pointing out certain of their foibles but you know would always yeah clearly have to worry about going one step too far because one step too far could have been you know a disaster yeah well, um, you could have had your head taken off that's but very... that happened comparatively rarely. Uh, <laughs> we don't actually have very many records of historical court jesters. I was looking this up, and um, uh, we we don't know names of most court jesters until, in fact, we're um, up to Henry VIII um, and Elizabeth I and that era. So more Renaissance than than the medieval connections, but they date back a lot longer. Um, yeah. There was a thing I remember seeing recently on QI about court jesters that there was a um, uh, a court jester to Henry II, uh, which goes back another few hundred years. But in looking further than that, I found um, uh, M oh, records of um, Augustine coming across people who could uh, fart for entertainment. Um, <laughs> oh, so, man, I love the Romans. A la Petamain style. That's in the 5th century. But the, the earliest court jester I have now come across is in China. Um, at the court of Qin Shi, Shi Huangdi, the first Qin emperor, he apparently had a court jester, a dwarf called Twisty Pole. That's a literal translation of his name. Um, and uh, apparently he would he he mocked some of um, the emperor's ideas. One of the things that the emperor planned to do was lacquer the entirety of the Great Wall of China. Now it, this is 207 or whatever BC, so the, the Great Wall was a um, just earth and brick, um, not stone thing that is later, and B, not as extensive as it is today. But he was going, as part of his you know, campaign of, of complete um, rebuilding of all the infrastructure and so forth, he was actually going to um, completely coat with lacquer the entire Great Wall of China uh, until he was mocked by his, his court jester and <laughs> decided it was a bad idea after all. <laughs> Supposedly this is the case. I, I've come across a couple of sources quoting it. So... Um, wow. I, I'm not able to go back to first sources. I mean, I'm assuming it's from Sima Chan's histories and so forth, because that's where we get nearly everything from um, the, the first Qin emperor's uh, historical records. Um, Sima Qian was a historian who was ordered to burn all of his records, and he didn't. He hid them. What a top person he was. <laughs> yeah. was huge amounts of, of fantastic historical information that he was supposed to have burned and he just hid instead and said, yep, yep, it's all gone now. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's funny. So yes, although we think of court jesters as, you know, the, the, the bell cap and the, the um, wacky um, tunic and the very, you know, medieval kind of hose look to them, um, I'd say the earliest I, I can find is actually in China. So they're clearly a thing that um, are not a particularly European invention after all, as so many things that we pretend or think <laughs> of are European <laughs> information turn out, yeah. no, actually we didn't do that first at all. We just borrowed it from somewhere else and then we stopped allowing them to have any you know, history and <laughs> overlaid our own instead. We're nice that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, so, um, <laughs> we had a long gesture. Sorry, not just, we had a yeah, long I was just. Topic. Thank you for telling us about your research, Brian. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea you would research this topic quite so thoroughly. That's great. Um,. Well, I don't know. I'm thinking about. Uh, I, I'm still back on that idea that uh, of of humor as a sort of safety. Um, and I think it's related to plaything in a way. Yeah. Because you have to be able to try something out and not be punished for it, or at least not killed for it. <laughs> um. So. So I think flirtation actually counts as a form of, of uh, humorous play that helps people practice approaching one another. <laughs> I think you could argue that, but I'm not sure. Um, you know. I think it depends on how smart the flirting is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it's just obvious, like innuendo then mm. not really but well 
you know, so kids like to joke about um, scatological and other uh, topics. Like sort of the lowest hanging fruit. Aside from some people say it's puns. That puns are the lowest form of humor. Sarcasm. Ooh. They all say <laughs> sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. Sure it is. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that, like, is, 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 like, I mean, sort of, like, yeah, because, like, okay, I, I kind of read a lot of middle grade books because that's what I want to do. Um, <laughs> and so, like, I go through the library and there are so many fart books. Oh, yeah. Like, in the middle grade section. <laughs> you know, there's one that's, like, fart, fart powder and Sir Farts a Lot and Captain Underpants and... Um, you know, the gross-out humor. Everybody, because everybody likes that, everybody farts are universally funny. Suppose, I guess. I'm assuming. Well, so, sort of. I don't, unless they're horribly offensive somewhere. It's a, it, that starts with kids very, very young. And I think yeah. part of it is, it's, it's, you know, one of the first things that they are told is, if you like, it's a form of, of taboo or verboten thing. As, as soon as they talk about that sort of stuff, they're generally told they shouldn't talk about it. So they go, right! <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, so I think what you've got is there are a few things going on. I think, I think body functions are, are fascinating to babies. Because they're learning about things for the first time, and it's like, I made something! Okay? <laughs> and it came from my butt! <laughs> <laughs> wow, there was this thing, and it used to be inside me, and now it's not! <laughs> so I think there's this sort of, sort of funny um, discovery thing that's going on with kids. But the instant they're told they're not supposed to talk about it, then it becomes a power game. Yep. And 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 so again, we're looking at a, 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 a sort of an interesting parallel with the position of the jester, right? Where the humor is about doing things that really aren't quite okay, right? And maybe and maybe seeing in your face power people, right? Even if you're doing it secretly, ooh, I am saying quietly in your face power people, <laughs> right? Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, yes. So definitely, um, I have power because my parents don't want me to do this. And yes, I am doing it. <laughs> um, I, that's a huge factor, I know, for, for many, many kids. Because they're trying out how to be themselves and having power over one another and having power that their parents may or may not be willing to give to them is a big deal uh, for them. And so, yes, there's a ton of potty humor. And, and my kids, who have been in an environment where that's treated as, yeah, okay, whatever, <laughs> really kind of, th they've got, they got over it long ago, right? And we occasionally will make jokes, and if they're, if they're clever and they have some other added dimension, maybe we'll think they're funny. But just like, oh, I said the word poop. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. I, I think it, a lot of it, a lot of what makes a particular thing humor has to do not with the thing itself, but the cultural conditions and rules, etc., around whatever this is that the person is doing. Well, I noticed, and you, I'm hoping you can possibly explain this more. Um, okay, like coming, like like out of Japan, if if you like all their little knickknacky, cute things they export, whatever. Okay. You will often find little golden poos, like <laughs> perfect little spiral golden poos. Um, I, I would like some explanation for because I also <laughs> like I saw a movie where a kid finds a talk. It was a Japanese movie. The kid finds a talking poo in the woods. <laughs> I do not remember the movie, but I, I remember, and they do a lot of stuff with poop. There's tons of poop stuff from Japan. They yeah. just love poop there. I well, think the, the Japanese, everybody poops is also Japanese. Yeah. Uh, so. I, I just think, I mean, I just think the cultural attitudes surrounding it a little bit different from ours. I can't really explain why it is the way it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I have a hard time. I have a hard time capturing. <laughs> I mean, 
I think it's too complex, actually, for yeah. me to really be able to, to explain anything about it. I mean, I remember we saw a TV show when we were visiting Japan recently where, you know, they had animated a folktale and, and this kid in the folktale had this magic belly button that would create gold pieces. Uh-huh. And I was like... <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? That's different. Well, yeah, exactly. But I mean, to them, it's like, oh, yeah, it's, oh, the classic story of the guy with the belly button that creates gold pieces with premium coins. What? <laughs> did, they, like, did they, like, come out of the belly button? Or did you just, like, touch stuff to his belly button? No, no, no. It was, um, like, when he stroked his belly button, it was, like, oh. a super outy. And he, when he played with his belly button, it would pull out. It would, like, produce gold pieces. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. So, just but it's like, but it's like those things don't necessarily like the gross-out, scatological and humor uh -huh. that that endures. I mean, like every teen movie, every like kind of college movie. It's yeah. like inevitable. It's like you can just, you know, you just have to sit there and wait for it to happen. Um. Right, and there, I I just think it has to do with the way that people grow up. Um, mm. That there's there's always a phase in somebody's life where they're just fascinated with body functions because because they're new. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of discovery and, and weird. Uh, there's a lot of discovery to humor. Um, I don't know. It, it is interesting. <laughs> why, why scatological humor? Well, I mean, and then like at times it is still funny, no matter what. Yeah, it's that's the right. Right context. Exactly. I'm thinking yeah. of um. Do you remember that time in uh, Finding Nemo when <laughs> they've just they've just set off all of the mines? And they all like go swimming away as fast as they can, and everything just blows up. And then on the surface of the water, you've got these two birds and this bubble yeah. that up, and it goes blip. And the, and the one bird turns to the other bird and just says, "Nice." Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and the other one is like, "What? That wasn't me. I, I didn't do it." <laughs> but like, now that that to me was well handled. I mean, I thought that was really funny. So well, then there was like the little kindergarten girl octopus who kept inking or something. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I inked. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. Yeah, I think I think that I think a lot of discomfort gets turned into humor. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. What was I going to say? Do any of you write humor? It's too bad I don't have Effie Seberg in this in this uh, hangout because she she writes humor. I I have um, written things that I hoped were funny. My, <laughs> my, my, my two graphic novels from Tokyo Pop, uh, Darkman Diary one and two were supposed to kind of be you know basically they, they were comedies and. Um, so the, these sort of running gags and things um, that, like, I hope we're good. <laughs> yeah. I hope we're all right. Um, you know, and, like, some kind of, you know, some visual humor and stuff. Um, you know, um, it's it's not, um, like, I think I've kind of tried, but it's hard. So there's a few people have told me that, like, um, Tea Times 3 is pretty funny. Yeah. Um, though, like, it wasn't, like, um, like, I'm not sure, like, I was trying. I think, I think in some ways, like, if you try, like, unless you, unless you really, can really, really craft humor, um, if you try too hard, it's terrible. Yeah, um, right. So, sometimes I just put in some things that I kind of think are funny, um, but I don't, like, press the point or try to make it into something. Um, mm -hmm. 
So, um, I mean, yeah, I do humor, things, humor so in, when I'm writing, I do things that I think are funny, <laughs> but they're not funny because I'm trying to be funny or because I'm ma trying to make a joke. Mm -hmm. They're mostly situations where people are doing things that are terribly unexpected from a reader's point of view, mm -hmm. but make absolute perfect sense within this alternate mindset that I've prepped people to accept. Yeah. And so I think it's probably the discrepancy between those two things that makes people laugh. That makes me laugh. Mm -hmm. Like my cold words, uh, my cold words guy who's hilarious because he's just such a dog, <laughs> and he does things that are just very doggy, and he does them all very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. But some people find that very funny. Yeah, yeah. Because he takes his, he takes his life as a you know gigantic embodiment of a dog very seriously. Well, that's the, the the funniest thing in Up is when the dog tells the joke, and the joke isn't funny at all, but the dog at the end says, it is funny because the squirrel is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen that movie. You've not seen that? It's a classic. It's, it's, I, it's I excellent. Know. There's a talking dog, and he's just he tells this long story, and it's supposed to be a joke, shaggy dog story kind of thing, and everyone's just going like, what? And at the end, he just he's just smiling there, and he goes, it is funny because the squirrel is dead. <laughs> I don't know. I guess he had to be because, there. Well, there but, is a yeah. squirrel. Sort of dog. dog. Like, my daughter, when she was a little girl, she used to be the queen of why did the ex cross the road jokes. And she would make them up constantly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, <laughs> and they were, and they were just. There was something about the non sequiturness of it that was hilarious. Um, so she would say, you know, you think, oh, well, why does the chicken cross the road? You know, why? So it's like a genre of joke in its own in its own right because it's yeah. okay. Well, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? And then when one of the th ones I always thought was rather funny was why did the punker cross the road? Because he was stapled to the chicken. Because he was stapled to the chicken, precisely. <laughs> um, but she took it into the realm of you know why did the peanut butter sandwich cross the road? And and then it would be like, well because it had to climb a tree, and you <laughs> look at it going. <laughs> Like, what? <laughs> you know, this little three-year-old telling you this this thing, and you're and, and she thought it was hilarious, and you just couldn't help but laugh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and just the incredible prolific nature of these jokes at the time. She would make you know twenty a day, hmm. and they would playing all with language. Yeah, that's definitely playing with language and exploring language, and and also exploring you know storytelling and its relation to truth in the world. I think too. You know how far can you take it before the sense making starts to fall apart? Um, yeah. yeah, world building. Then, like, I mean, there's <laughs> sort of there's like this sort of punchline joke from you know joke joke book jokes the question answer joke. Uh -huh. And then there's like the story jokes that people, you know, like have you have some story mm -hmm. to tell and reflect on and offer opinions on. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if it like complicates as you get older because, you know, you don't, or maybe it's just the styles change because you don't, you know, like the, 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 the zingy one-liners of like Rodney Dangerfield, nobody does that anymore. Um, you know, you, you have, I think, somewhat more cerebral humor now, in, 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 in some ways. Really? And then some of it is just, well, like, some of it, like, I'm thinking, like, okay, Louis C.K. and Mark Maron, um, are, like, the really cerebral, um, type, despite, you know, Louis C.K. plies, you know, the, the, the profanity, uh, really hard, but um, you know, but his points are often profound. Um, and yeah. then you have something like um, things that are mean, funny, and it's like there's there's one comedian, okay, Daniel Tosh, who I I do like, um, and I like his brand of mean, is what I say. 
Um, uh, so I find him funny. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. you know, it's, it's I. <clears throat> we could spend a long time, I think, talking about the role of profanity and humor, and and you know, because there are some people who don't use it and are exceedingly funny, and Not there are many people, that some I can people think who of. use I mean, it who are exceedingly funny, and then there are people who, when they use it, it is really funny. I mean, so that that there's a very complex interrelationship thing there. You know, oh, I, I didn't mean, tell you a story I'm though. Actually, almost, I'm trying to think of a comedian who doesn't use. A lot of profanity, and it's almost become part of the comedy act now. In that it is yeah. mandatory, and it, it is to push those boundaries. Is because the shock value. It's like you have to push the shock value harder. Oh, Eddie Izzard. Okay, I don't. I haven't seen his like comedy specials or Mike Birbiglia. Oh, they're yeah. definitely cut. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I know. Yeah, see, and comedy is super subjective. Well, like, yeah, I think I, I heard that scoff yes. when I said Daniel Tosh. <laughs> the The Muppet Show. That's and, true. And Sesame Street. Well, I mean, those are, are like, so, like humorous, you have but they to... don't use profanity at all. Well, yeah, so you, but I mean, that's you wait, you wait till the new Muppets uh, series comes out. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll see. It right? could have changed. I mean, one of the things that makes John Stewart funny when he swears mm -hmm. is because he's posturing the position of a news anchor. Mm -hmm. And so I guess when I just he lets his, his personal anger and and his ability to use profanity show that then, then it takes you into this sort of this, it's a sort of a, an incongruity, right? There's a sort of mm -hmm. uh, peeking beneath the surface of this Civilized veneer and seeing what what people really think about the news kind of mm -hmm. thing, which I think actually is very very effective, um, you know. And then there and then there are all those. Well, you know, actually, you could do a whole study of just the interviews that are done for the Daily Show, mm -hmm. um, because some of them have profanity, but some of them have a lot less profanity and. And the, the people doing the interviewing are, are just asking particular types of questions. Yeah. Well, and the humor is in there, the floundering responses of... Or, like, or the, the people who are I'm not, on I'm their not own even sure form. I believe those are real, some of them. Like, I yeah. almost feel like, like they do an interview, get the question, get the answers, and then write and film new questions. Um, well, I couldn't speak to that. I know, Not, uh, I know, I know. Because some of them seem so, like, ridiculous. Um, there, there, there was one on the Colbert Report that was absolute genius where he was interviewing, it was one of the Know Your District. And the guy, the senator or something, he was like talking about like 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 you know their their tech the tech products, and he he does like a robot voice. The senator guy did like a robot voice and stuff. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so like it was sort of like that humor coming out, you know, because usually you know they're so stuffy and serious, and then you know this guy's like do a robot voice. <laughs> I'm like oh my god. <laughs> So I'm gonna. I, I would love to tell you a little uh, a little story right before we uh, wrap up, which is about the fact that I suddenly became funny on my last trip to Japan. No. Oh. <laughs> um, now, I am really really bad at grasping Japanese humor. Uh, if I watch what is considered to be a comedy show in Japan, I just sit there and look at it. <laughs> I think that's the reaction of most Americans. Ah, uh, right. Don't get it. Um. Anime translates better. Yeah. Well. Anyway. So regardless. Um. But but I do like to make linguistic jokes as as people people do know about me, and and what was funny was that all the time that I was studying there, and even when I lived there and I was doing my PhD research there, I could never make a joke, because every time I tried to make a joke, I would be told, no 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 no, that's not actually how it works. It it works like this, and it was like. Yeah, I know. I I was kidding, or I you know I was joking around. Sarcasm does not work in Japan. <laughs> there's, there's, sarcasm is not a thing. Um, 
I, I was in a car one time, and, uh, you know, people tend to stop their cars in the weirdest places in Japan because there's no place to park. So, so <laughs> we were driving along, and, and there was this car in the middle of the intersection. And so we had to kind of swerve around it. And, and we were only speaking Japanese out of courtesy to the driver who was, who was a Japanese person. The rest of us were all English speakers. And I, and I sort of said in a sarcastic way to my English-speaking friends, though I said it in Japanese, oh, yeah, you know, I always love to leave my car out in the middle of the intersection. It's so much fun when things go bump, you know. Um, and the driver was like, you what? <laughs> I'm like, uh, it was, it was a joke, right? <laughs> So, so the sarcasm, like you can't, you can't. First of all, you can't count on the parameters of jokes being the same. Um, but the other thing was that when I went back this last time, some of the jokes that I made, it two or three times this happened, people actually laughed. Oh wow! And I was like, wait a second, I've graduated. <laughs> and and it may be because I have children with me. And all of a sudden, the focus on me as a learner is less than the focus on them as learners, and I'm suddenly subconsciously promoted to expert as a result of their presence. But all of a sudden, people were willing to accept that I might be making a joke. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was actually a really, really interesting thing. I've, I've heard that... Um a lot of humor in Japan are these, and I've, I've seen some anime that do it, and, and you, when you read, like, the DVD notes, you know, in, in the extra section is copious explanations of what the characters are saying. Um, where it's a lot of wordplay, like, really complicated pun things that mm -hmm. are funny to no one else in the world. Unless, well, there's, you know, um... Like. There is a ton, in Japan. There is a ton of um, uh, what would I call it? Intertextuality, but like referring to older texts. I mean, we do that here too, right? Mm -hmm. We make jokes about Shakespeare or or that kind of thing. But right. I mean, our familiarity with Japanese texts is just much much <laughs> lower. Yeah. And so when when they're joking about, oh yeah, it's like that thing. You were like, what thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, there is that. Uh, we are at the end of the hour. I know we started late, but um, it does end up being that it becomes 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you guys are all amazing, and there's been actually this is what's fun is I have talked about this topic before but not in the era of the actual recorded Hangouts. Mm -hmm. And what's fun for me is that this Hangout was totally different from the last Hangout that I had on <laughs> It was really fun, which is why, you know, which is why it's always worth coming back and, and, and resuming a topic, because um, it's really, really fun. Anyway, so um, we're going to wrap up, but we have a guest next week. Um, the time will be the same. It's going to be 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific uh, next Wednesday, and our guest will be Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. Um, and so we're going to talk about her new novel, and we're going to talk about some of her work. And it should be really, really fun. So I hope you guys can make it. And anybody who is in the meantime watching this video, I hope you guys can make it too. So Yes, Signal to Noise. Yes, absolutely. That's the name of her book. Thank you, Brian, for providing that to me when I was not coming up with it in my brain. <laughs> All right. So I hope to see you next week. I'm going to stop the broadcast.